Greetings, everyone. In an effort to fulfill all the requests for it, this is a recording of the entire presentation you may share with others. This is Bonnie Gasper of the Child Protection League. I have been in the educational trenches since my oldest was headed off to kindergarten. It was at that time I started to pay attention to what was being taught in our schools, and based upon what I discovered, I said, whoa, whoa wait a minute, time out. So here I am, 23 years later, still fighting the good fight. But it's an honor to serve on the board of the Child Protection League. We call this presentation The Raging War Against Children, understanding the psychological warfare that has been unleashed against children and families. When Child Protection League hosted its first major event back in 2014, we called it The Raging War Against Kids. We focused more on what was being taught, but we think it's time to take a deeper dive not only about the what, but to connect the dots by showing you the links between how and why it's being taught. How is this war being waged against our children and why? But before we dig in, here's a brief introduction to our organization, as some of you may not be familiar with us. Child Protection League's mission is to promote the welfare of children by protecting them from exploitation, indoctrination, and violence. We follow cultural trends, public policy, legislation, education, and curriculum, and then we educate and equip parents and the public about these issues. We originally formed in 2013 to defeat the anti-bullying bill, which was called the Safe and Supportive Schools Act. It was not a popular position to be against a so-called anti-bullying bill, you know, to be anti-anti-bullying, but we knew the bill established a huge new bureaucracy whose purpose was to codify into law all of the things that we're fighting today. It was going to make protected classes of certain people based upon race and sexual identity. It would normalize the entire LGBTQ ideology. It would ultimately force compelled speech and undermine parental rights. These are four key points to keep in mind as you see how this law is dictating curriculum and driving the PSYOPs against our kids. I hope to answer the following questions for you. What exactly are we dealing with? How did we get here? Specifically, how has it changed education and why? What is our responsibility and what can we do about it? Again, ultimately, I want to connect some dots for you so you can see that what we're seeing today is not just some organic evolution of our culture, but the logical outcome of a targeted, organized strategy that has transformed education. The architects of this have used psychological warfare as a fundamental tactic to achieve this transformation. First, what is psychological warfare? Well, it's really a military concept, and it's appropriate that we look at it in this context because it uses propaganda and terror to create the desired attitude in the targeted population. In this case, it's our children. It's a continual distortion and denial of reality. Now, the enemies or targets of these PSYOPs are Western civilization because it's built upon a moral code that recognizes individual liberty, justice, and higher, a higher moral authority for which you and I are all equal. Western values are predominantly Judeo-Christian as well. So Christianity is absolutely the enemy of the state, and so is truth. Because the state intends to define truth, because it wants to define reality, because the state wants to control how you think. And of course, a nuclear family and parents. Now the nuclear family has been the foundation of civilization since the beginning of time because a family is actually the most powerful institution on earth. Because families teach their own children their values and morals, and, re and they are able to restrict how much outside influence is allowed to penetrate this circle. So children are clearly in the crosshairs of the change agents. They are the spoils of this war. They really are considered a soft target because their minds are so malleable and immature. It's been said that a child's mind is like wet cement. Whatever falls on it makes an impression. Well, most of these impressions become permanent. You know, we've heard the, the whole saying, garbage in, garbage out. Well, the same goes for what is good as well. So which is why those, though, who are perpetrating the psychological warfare on our kids, they have their sights set on their children. They have them set on their minds. We're 100% convinced this is a spiritual battle. And because it's spiritual, it's a war over what is true, a war of, between good and evil. What is reality? What's actually true? Because truth, by definition, is absolute. It's based upon facts, not feelings, what is real. So this is why they go after the emotions of our kids. They go after their hearts and minds because, again, they're malleable, trusting, and vulnerable. They can't discern when they're being lied to because the ultimate goal is to change the culture into the utopia they envision. It's a cultural revolution without firing a shot. 
It's a cultural revolution from within. Now there are many forms of psychological warfare. We'll briefly look at these and how they relate to the education of our children. It's gonna be more of a 30,000 foot view, obviously because of time. But we're gonna look at gaslighting, disinformation and propaganda, marginalization and isolation, suppression and censorship, trauma and fear, and mass formation psychosis. Gaslighting is a covert, aggressive way of distorting another person's perception of reality to the point that that person questions their own sanity, their own memory. Gaslighters often make their targets think they're actually going crazy because they don't see or remember things as a gaslighter does. That way the gaslighter gets to control the narrative. But gaslighting really is lying with a goal because the motive is to make you question and distrust yourself. And that means that you're gonna to defer to the abuser then for an account of what's real. So slowly over time, the abuser or the expert gets to define what's true. It really is emotional and mental abuse. And gaslighters are truly masters of projection as well. They always accuse you of the very things they are actually doing. But a gaslighting teacher, a situation would be something like this. A young girl comes to school, she doesn't like to play with dolls and she's a little bit more of a tomboy. The teacher might just start planting seeds like, gee, maybe you really are a boy. Maybe that's why you don't like to play with dolls. Disinformation is very similar. Disinformation is false information that is deliberately spread through trusted sources. It's not like misinformation, which could be an honest mistake or misrepresentation because disinformation is deliberate, it's intentional. And because of this, it makes Whopper lies actually more believable. Because when you hear someone you trust stating a Whopper, you think, wow, they really wouldn't say something like that if it wasn't true. They wouldn't stake their reputation on that if not, right? A whopper lie would be like a teacher telling kids that boys can get pregnant and have babies, but it's often used to destroy the reputation of another person or the truth through a steady and deliberate and repeated false narrative. We know the mainstream media, they're experts at disinformation because disinformation really is the spreading of fake facts. Now, marginalization and isolation, this is especially ugly and toxic. Most often when the liar can't defend or prove their point, they just resort to name calling and labeling to shut down the discussion. That's why you get slapped with the label of racist, a homophobe, bigot, misogynist, whatever. But very often when parents book appointments with teachers and administrators to discuss their concerns about curriculum, for instance, they're often told, well, you're the only one with concerns. You're the outlier. Nobody else is asking questions. So thoughtful, factual opinions and beliefs are often labeled extreme in this world too, because when you slap an extreme label on someone, it makes them sound unreasonable in nature and opinion, and that people who think like that are dangerous. It simultaneously then infers that the crazy position is somehow normal, accepted, and good. But of course, again, the objective is division and isolation and impugning one's character and erasing all justification for a reasonable conversation. Because if, because if they say the ejector is an extreme person, they shouldn't even be taken seriously. So that way their mission can contain, continue without interference. Plus when you isolate someone and you don't allow them to meet or find like-minded people, it's a lot easier to defeat and discourage someone who feels alone in the fight. You know, we weaken their resolve. Now suppression and censorship, these are huge problems right now. They aren't harmless. This is why free speech and freedom of expression are not negotiable to any free society. We're not free if we cannot think and speak freely. Dr. Stella Morabito put on a conference for us a number of years ago, and she's an ex-CIA intelligence analyst and propaganda expert, and she wrote that when the truth is censored, propaganda that psychologically manipulates a population is key to laying the groundwork for extreme social polarization and ultimately for genocide. I know that sounds like a strong statement, but that's always how it's worked throughout history. It never ends well. People who wish to control other people do not and cannot allow people to think for themselves. They get rid of you if you become a serious obstacle. But this sort of propaganda, it thrives on ignorance. It is information warfare because it divides people against each other. And the narrative is propaganda because everything else is censored. It's often emotion-based, not fact-based, because we know that facts are stubborn things. And groupthink is always the goal so that those on the outside can be called extremists and the group can be controlled. And often it's a very aggressive canceling or shouting down of different viewpoints. But that's a fundamental tactic of some of the most powerful platforms like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. 
and they're certainly happy to comply. And they often throw in some good old gaslighting too with their fact checkers, right? That it's for the common good somehow to protect others from misinformation in order to protect our democracy. Well, obviously, you know, they don't think we're you know, bright enough to discern the difference between what they're saying. But think about how many times that parents at school board meetings have had their mics turned off. Or how many times have screaming protesters shouted down invited speakers? How many times have you heard the mainstream media calling highly credentialed people like the inventor of mRNA technology conspiracy theorists or, dis or people who spread misinformation? I mean, Twitter shut down the, the account of the sitting president of the United States of America for crying out loud. So rather than the Ministry of Truth, it really is a Ministry of Propaganda. But every once in a while, they do say the quiet part out loud. That's exactly what I hear. What Yamish just said is what I hear from all the Trump supporters that I talk to who were Trump voters and are still Trump supporters. They go, yeah, you guys are going crazy. He's doing, what are you so surprised about? He's doing exactly what he said he's going to do. Well, and I think that the dangerous you know, edges here are that he's trying to undermine the media, trying to make up his own facts. And it could be that while unemployment and uh, the, the economy worsens, he could have undermined the messaging so much that he can actually control right. uh, exactly what people think. And that if, is the that is our you, job. Yeah. Oh, Mika, did you hear what she said? That's their job to control how we think. And this is how telling the truth about gender and race becomes hate speech. If you question the vaccine, you're a science denier. If you question the election results, you're a threat to democracy. I mean, it's total gaslighting and manipulation of the language. Because again, remember that changing the meaning of words, redefining the meaning of words, this is a key strategy for all psyops. Now, suppression and censorship, these are primary weapons of the cancel culture. There were really four great waves of cancel culture. In the 60s, the radicals rejected classical tenets of freedom and they viewed free speech and constitutional democracy simply as tools of the oppressive ruling class. Then in the mid 1980s, the long march hit colleges. As the radicals graduated and began to do the teaching, these faculty abolished Western civ classes in favor of revisionist history and this helped to launch then the academic culture war. So who or what drove the long march? It was driven by intellectuals who heavily influenced education. There were three primary ones, including the Frankfurt School, but they were foundational in changing the educational system in America. The first we'll mention here is George, George Lukacs. He was considered one of the main founders of Western Marxism and the inspiration behind the Frankfurt School, which is a pretty significant institution. But he understood that Christianity and Western civilization, i.e. the family, were obstacles to communism. And he said that both had blinded the working class to its true Marxist class interests. And like the voices of the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, he was a total globalist and he advocated for the destruction of Western society and old values to create new ones. Because cultural Marxism really is simply the great reset. Wilhelm Reich was a highly influential psychoanalyst, Marxist and sexual revolutionary from the early 1900s. He was a graduate of the Frankfurt School, and he wrote in his book, The Sexual Revolution, that the sexualiza sexualization of the culture was necessary to destroy the social order and the family. And he viewed the family as oppressive, so he said we had to replace the nuclear family with a classless society, and the primary way to get there was by sexualizing the children. The Frankfurt School then was founded in 1923 in Germany with the goal of destroying Christian culture in Germany. But ironically, they had to flee when Hitler came to power because each member was not only a Marxist, but a Jew. So then they reestablished at Columbia University in the US, which is still a large teaching college here. And they changed their focus simply to destroying Christian culture in the US. But they realized the US working class was a little different. They were not gonna revolt because Americans were aspiring to the middle class. They believed in capitalism and they had a good work ethic. So instead they had to organize people into groups like blacks and feminists, homosexuals and students and convince them that they were victims and marginalized. So they simply were really community organizers and agitators. But they intended to destroy the Christian culture in America by these primary things. 
They were going to create racial offenses. They were going to create confusion by continual change, teach sex and homosexuality to children, undermine authority, massive immigration to destroy the American identity, promote excessive drinking, empty the churches, create a legal system that sympathized with the criminal and not the victim, create a dependency upon the state, control and dumb down the media, break down the family and the education of boys and girls, and declare men oppressors and women as oppressed. Well, <laughs> when you look at that list, clearly they have accomplished their goals. Do you see it in our nation today? Are these not all the things that are destroying our country right now? But do you hear the common thread? the sexualization of our children. And we need to be familiar with Antonio Gramsci as he is credited with the long mar march through the institutions. For this was a fundamental tenet of his educational policies which American education fully embraced in the 60s. He was an Italian communist from the 1930s and he believed that culture, not economics, was a center to any revolution. Whoever controlled the social institutions would control the rest of society. And his approach to education was simply this. He believed that if you can change how children think and speak, you will create social change. He knew you had to fully capture the children to revolutionize the culture. So this long march, this has been incubating in all of our public institutions since the 60s. Gramsci is also known as the father of transformational education and his strategies were to deconstruct the language because language, again, largely determines how we think. Truth had to be relative and personal, not objective and absolute. There could be no standard by which we all were held to account. So basically, anything goes. He had to create a group conscience by assigning beliefs and perceptions to this identity, and then he had to emphasize power and group identity. The third anti-free speech wave then was called the takeover. This began in the mid-1990s as the older generation of professors just began to retire. At this point, the younger, more radical generation of faculty reached critical mass. They censored critical thought, and they achieved an institutional monopoly. So by the 2000s, they dominated social science and humanities departments, and they held considerable power on campus. And then the fourth anti-free speech wave, this is what we call the transformed generation. This is a generation that marinated in this Marxist ideology for their entire educational career, from pre-K through college. So these are the late millennial students who demanded safe spaces and trigger warnings while shouting down invited speakers. But they also seem unable to cope in healthy ways with disappointment. I mean, who can forget this poor woman? <laughs> she's she will live in infamy um but you know basically they say there can be no other side to what they believe you have no right to challenge what they think or they just simply melt down but this is where we're living right now it feels if it feels like an explosion all around us that's because it is these radicals now hold positions in government corporate america media churches schools and academia even science as we've all seen firsthand these last couple of years it's like they've reached critical mass with their radical worldview because they're writing, they run companies, they write laws, they've captured education, they direct culture. I mean, this is why it's all around us. But next time someone tells you that censorship will save our democracy, tell them this. The truth can handle a few questions. Seriously, the truth can handle a few questions. If something's true, it will survive scrutiny. It will survive questions because questions expose lies which is why we're not allowed to ask any. Questions must be censored and shut down. We cannot challenge or question the elite's narrative or plans. But I'll tell you what, questions are only dangerous to the people who are lying to you. Now trauma and fear, this is especially powerful because pain and fear trigger emotional responses. Children internalize mental abuse. They think they are the ones to blame and the guilt is really powerful, but even adults will trade freedom for perceived safety. Fear easily replaces critical thinking, and little kids just simply can't process what's really going on. I mean, we often think about the child who is gender confused, for instance, but think about the kids who are not. Think about this example. A child goes to kindergarten. She's been secure in her identity for five, six years. Suddenly she's taught she might be in the wrong body, or her best friend could become a boy. Or the doctor, the medical professional, made a mistake when he assigned her gender at birth? I mean, how the heck does a little kid process this? This is emotional trauma. This is an attack on her mind. 
Or think about the little girl who walks into her bathroom and discovers a couple of teenage boys in there. Do you think she feels safe in there now? Or how about the kids who have already been assaulted in their school bathrooms by gender-confused kids, and the school has just pretty much told them just deal with it because everybody has the right to be in the bathroom that they choose. This isn't inclusion. This is psychological trauma at the basis level, personal, physical, and bodily privacy level. Dr. Robert Malone and Dr. Peter McCullough have discussed mass formation psychosis at length. Now, mass formation psychosis is most often connected to religious cults because four things really need to happen for this to occur. So think about this in the context of what has happened to us since early 2020. First, you must create a prolonged period of isolation. Then you have to take away things that people hold dear, like a job, family, freedom, right, your business. Then you have to have constant messaging, which creates anxiety and fear. And then there must be an, only a single solution that's offered from a single authority to get back what you lost. Now, while it's hard to believe that so many people were influenced like this, again, fear is very, very powerful. People will give up a lot, including critical thinking, in order to feel safe. Now, obviously, people are free to make their own decisions about the vaccines, but the psyops and censorship behind this whole campaign should have raised many, many red flags. But as it relates to COVID and the shots, it quickly became apparent that they didn't do what we were promised. So here we are today, over two years into just two weeks to flatten the curve. So I couldn't help myself. I just felt this meme sums it up perfectly for the COVID vaccine solution. It basically says the protected need to be protected from the unprotected by forcing the unprotected to use a protection that didn't protect the protected. Right. <laughs> well, so now that we've looked at some of the psychological warfare tactics that have been unleashed against us and our kids, let's look more closely at how they're being deployed through curriculum. Now, social emotional learning, this is the new label for Gramsci's transformational education. It's simply the same old, same old with a new name, but it's teaching children how to think and speak. I call it really the mothership of critical race theory, comprehensive sex ed, equity and diversity, social justice, and inclusion for all things LGBTQIA. But it has essentially replaced academics with politically and ideologically charged content to guide our kids and our children to embrace and believe what the change agents have declared as acceptable values, attitudes, and beliefs. Now we're gonna look at just CRT and CSE for now, um, uh, comprehensive sex ed and critical race theory, not because we have some kind of obsession with them, but because you have just heard how the radicals intended to transform our children by what? Two things, dividing them and sexualizing them. These are the two primary strategies or tactics that they are using to transform our culture. So boiled down to its fundamental tenets, critical race theory teaches that all people must be divided by skin color. This is their identity. All whites are innately oppressors, victimizers, and racist and inherently privileged. All non-whites are oppressed, victims, and unable to be racist. All Western forms of government are systemically racist and designed to oppress non-whites. CRT teaches that America is fundamentally racist, so if you love this racist country, that makes you a racist for sure. So clearly, patriotism is racist. You see how that works? Whites must advocate for white abolition, and it's a mousetrap argument. Failing to admit you're a racist simply proves you are one. There can be no debate, no questions. But every child loses with CRT. White kids are taught they are evil, guilty, and shameful, and non-white kids are taught they're perpetual victims. It's just sick. And they start this indoctrination early. This ABC book for toddlers has been used in the Edina schools. Here's another. In New York, two-year-olds now are being taught that the white race is a fictional or made-up race and that white people simply sorted out other people by their skin color because they thought white people were prettier. Now, CRT advocates, they always conflate, conflate equality with equity as well. This is what they say CRT and equity will result in, an equal outcome where everybody gets the same result and everybody looks like they win. But this is really what happens because equity is not equality. Equity is tied to the term social justice. 
it's used to get equal outcomes, which are very different from equal opportunities. Because social justice demands things to be taken from the privileged group and given to the underprivileged group to achieve equity. So individual achievement, character, responsibility, these things don't matter. So this is what really happens. Everyone loses under equity. Here is the truth about all of those who are pushing this stuff on our kids. Race matters only to racists. The rest of us care about character. And that's what they're doing through CRT. They're teaching our kids to hate each other, to be divided, jealous, victims, or ashamed of themselves depending upon which color they are. But they should be teaching them what Booker T. Washington said. He said, I will permit no man to narrow and degrade my soul by making me hate him. CRT is incredibly toxic and backwards. And here truly is the best way to end it all. Just stop telling our kids they're racist. I mean, seriously, our children need to be told the truth, that there's only one race, the human race. We are all equal before God. Suggesting otherwise is a bald-faced lie. It's total disinformation. It's total gaslighting. The truth is we just look different from each other. We're different ethnicities due to the melanin in our skin, not different races. So we should be unified. So now we're going to move on to comprehensive sex ed, or CSE. The current architects of CSC openly admit their agenda. I often say that the uh, demons <laughs> they really do like to telegraph what they're doing. But CECAS stands for the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States. They are the un unholy alliance that formed between Kinsey Institute and Planned Parenthood. But see what they have on their website? They view sex ed as their vehicle for social change. In fact, they see CSE as their golden opportunity to create a culture shift in the areas of reproductive justice, which is just a euphemism for abortion, LGBTQ equality, gender equity, and dismantling white supremacy. Not exactly sure how that's related to sex ed, but it's on the list. But does this sound like an education or more like a revolution? And you may be asking the question as well, does CECAS actually hold real power? Well, they absolutely do, because CECAS writes the majority of sex ed curriculum in the U.S. They write all the national teacher prep standards. They're the largest promoter of CSC in the U.S., and they lobby for CSC to be mandated curriculum in every public school in America at every grade level, pre-K through 12. I always think it's helpful to hear what uh, advocates for this kind of stuff say in their own words. Hi, I'm Ellie Barnes and I am CEO of Educate and Celebrate and we are a charity that transforms schools and organisations into LGBT friendly places. So predominantly we are training teachers because we want our teachers to be really, really confident in the language of gender identity and sexual orientation. So they are speaking the same language as our young people. Diversity and all, it starts with education. I think, you know, tolerance and LGBTQI issues all should start with education. Um, so, you know, companies like this are super important for going in and just and teaching that and getting, having dialogues, you know, getting people to talk about it. You know, because there's a lot of things going on in school that I think are kind of ignored. And people like Ellie go in and, and bring that up and it's a safe space all of a sudden for any children that are having issues to, to speak about it. The whole concept of Educate and Celebrate is to treat everyone equally and fairly. And really the bottom line is to completely smash heteronormativity. That's what we want to do. So our kids can grow up and be who they are. Because we are all more productive and we are all so much happier when we can be ourselves. So we totally encourage intersectional ways of teaching, lots of pedagogies around usualising, so making LGBT plus people an everyday occurrence within the school. And that can come through by simply teachers being out, it can come through the curriculum, it can come through what you're putting on the wall, so in the environment, and how you're engaging with your community. And that's our goal. That's her goal. Did you hear what she said? You know, they want to transform schools. They want to smash what's normal. Even they call it normal. They want to make LGBTQ an everyday occurrence by basically homosexualizing the entire educational system. And they start them very young. Preschoolers now are being taught their genders can be created or changed or even wrong. Graphics like this one are used in classrooms all across America. 
this is a gender bred person. The kids are taught here that gender is not a biological and provable reality, but it's a construct, a compilation of four things. It's who or what they think they are, who or what they're attracted to, how they behave and express themselves, and then finally their actual biology or their genetics. So now kids are told they can mix and match these things together to create an identity out of thin air. Kids are taught they can actually have no gender or even change genders from time to time as they feel like it. Here's another one, the gender unicorn. And as you can see by the cutesy graphics, they're targeting our littlest ones. But grade schools are now hosting gender reveal parties too for little kids who want to identify some, someone else. And the rest of the class is just supposed to go along with it. I mean, again, think about the PSYOP that's going on here. Johnny's best friend goes home as Sam on Friday, and then he returns as Jessica on Monday, and he's supposed to not ask any questions. He's just supposed to go along with it and affirm it. And think about the whole demand for everyone to use someone's preferred pronouns. In the context of the fact that, fact that we're dealing with demonic strongholds, what comes to mind when a child wants to be addressed as they or them? Doesn't it make you think they're harboring multiple personal personalities or spirits? But the gender radicals are getting to our children through the public libraries as well. Your tax dollars are helping to fund the normalization of Drag Queen Story Hour. So now we have grown men dressed as hypersexualized women reading only LGBTQ affirming books to our little kids. They dance around, they prance around, they even have kids sit on their laps. And that Sasha Soda in the upper right, the guy in the miniskirt, check out what's eye level with the kids. He flashed his crotch over and over during his story time to these kids. You would never get away with something like that in any other venue, not even a grocery store. On June 4th, year of 2022, Pine City hired Martina Maracino to host their family-friendly Pride event. Well, Maracino is a self-proclaimed Satanist and an amateur pornographer. He films his sexual fantasies with his little brother. Again, all of this stuff is being sold as teaching our kids about inclusion, but is it safe and wise to groom children to become intrigued and curious about a lifestyle that's actually quite dangerous and well-known to be self-destructive? What does an honest drag queen have to say about all of this? Hi, everybody. This is Kitty Demure, your friendly favorite conservative drag queen. <laughs> anyway, I have another message for heterosexual women the ones who have children. I have no idea why you want drag queens to read books to your children. I have no idea. What, what in the hell has a drag queen ever done to make you have so much respect for them and admire them so much, other than put on makeup and, and jump on the floor and writhe around and do sexual things on stage? I have absolutely no idea why you would want that to influence your child. Would you want a stripper or a porn star to influence your child? It, it makes no sense at all. A drag queen performs in a nightclub for adults. There is a lot of filth that goes on, a lot of sexual stuff that goes on. And backstage, there's a lot of nudity, sex, and drugs. Okay? So I don't think that this is... a, a an avenue you would want your child to explore. They could explore dressing up at home like we all did, like all gay boys did. We all dressed at home and we had a great time. We had a great time with our girlfriends, putting on makeup, trying on clothes, things like that. But to actually get them involved in drag is extremely, extremely irresponsible on your part. And I understand you might want to look like you're with it, that you're cool, that you're woke, that you're not a Nazi, that you're not a homophobe, whatever, whatever it may be. But you can raise your child to be just a normal, regular, everyday child without including them in gay, sexual things. And honestly, you're not doing the gay community any favors. In fact, you're hurting us, okay? 
We have already had a reputation of being pedophiles and being perverts and deviants. We don't need you to bring your children around. So you keep your kids at home or take them to Disneyland or take them to Chuck E. Cheese. But if you need your child to be entertained by a big human in a costume or in makeup, take them to the circus or something. When they turn 18, then why don't you take them to the clubs on their 18th birthday? Because it's an adult thing, okay? So don't ruin your child's life and don't ruin us because that's what you're doing. So you gotta love Kitty Demure. At least he's being honest. But the only thing I would disagree with him on is you may not want to bring your kiddos to Disney anymore now that they've been outed as groomers and pedophiles, right? So then as the children get older, they start using textbooks like this one. This is called It's Perfectly Normal. Now this textbook is for fourth graders. It teaches our 10 year olds that vaginal, anal, and oral sex are perfectly normal. Masturbation alone or with others is normal. They learn all about abortion and it uses pornographic illustrations in detail to teach kids about sexual practices. And it encourages early exploration because of course consent is a pretty big deal in this book as well. These are just more pictures from that same book. Now we have blurred the images, but they are crystal clear in the book. You may find it very interesting to know that in 2019, when the Minnesota House voted to make CSE state law and a mandate for all public school pre-K through 12, the local news stations refused to show images from this textbook saying they were too explicit for their adult viewing audience, but somehow they're okay for 10 year olds. So obviously the Captain Obvious question is, how can it be okay for kids? Well, because in 43 states, including Minnesota, we have something called an obscenity exemption statute. That means simply if the material is considered educational, quote unquote, they can show it to children. And unfortunately, way too many parents find out their kids are learning about this stuff after the damage has already been done. This was posted by a Minnetonka parent in the Nextdoor app a few months ago. Her 12 year old came home upset after learning about anal sex in class. Never heard of it before and he was sitting next to a little girl. Not only have the ABCs been politicized, they've been sexualized as well. Remember, the cultural Marxist goal is cultural revolution by sexualizing our children. Here's a brief clip to show you what that looks like. Is now a woke toddler. This is the thing now, right? It's not the pumps. It's not the minivan. It's not the $1,200 stroller. It's having that woke toddler by your side. Let's take a look. E is for ally. E is for bye. C is for coming out. D is for drag. E is for equality. E and, e and what was the name of this book? The Gay BCs. <laughs> you like this book? Yes. Are you a woke toddler? Yes. Can you say, I'm woke? I'm woke. I mean, how sad is that? This video goes all the way to the end. This little boy has memorized his ABCs to Z and you know, what is he, maybe four or five years old, but now part of his working vocabulary includes words like gay and intersex and pansexual, trans, coming out drag, I mean, seriously. His worldview has been changed. Now, because we're talking about psychological warfare, this is a serious question. Think about what being trans actually claims. Think about how important changing the language is to the revolutionists. Remember, they have to change how you think and speak. So as it relates then to being trans, can people really switch their biological sex? Can people really transition from male to female or female to male? Can people really be no gender at all? And every time you use this word, think again about what you're participating with. Think about Gramsci's deconstruction of the language because language changes how people think and ultimately the culture. are they manipulating us with the language we are also being told now not to believe what we can see with our own eyes either our kids are being told that boys who think they're girls really are girls and that it's somehow fair to let them compete against girls in sports to be in their showers their locker rooms and bathrooms i mean seriously how is this nothing more than an than an attack on our minds 
How is this nothing more than pure propaganda, disinformation, and gaslighting? I mean, this actually is a whopper lie, is it not? Does believing you're a girl actually make you one? I mean, seriously, uh, listen to how they explained Leah Thomas here as well, that this male swimmer, you know, they said Leah Thomas was breaking barriers and shattering records. Well, duh. I mean, he's a dude. Again, this is just propaganda. It's total manipulation of language. And another thing, if you actually do get the rare chance to question someone about this, now you're told you can't even declare what a woman is or a man unless you have some kind of advanced degree in biology. I mean, not even the newest Supreme Court Justice, Judge Brown Jack Jackson, would define woman without first seeing all the facts. Now, the trans advocates, they've done a masterful job of manipulating the language. This is straight out of Gramsci 101. Take a look at just a few examples here. Gender is now a personal construct and was assigned at birth. Now, this infers that even your doctor, the medical professional, wasn't sure. So he just assigned one. So there's really a 50% chance he actually got it wrong. So denying your actual biology then and pursuing something that's biologically impossible, this is now called gender affirming. And when you remove healthy sex organs and you conscript children to a lifetime of medical intervention, drugs, and sterility, this is called gender affirmation surgery. And if you don't affirm gender confused people, you're automatically labeled a hater. And as it relates to conversion therapy, the radicals are trying to ban this kind of counseling, which actually helps a gender confused individual accept their God given biology, how they were actually born. In fact, it's known um, through, through decades of research that if you don't interfere and intervene with a child who is gender confused, 85 to 95% of them by the time they get through puberty, are comfortable in their biological sex. But again, calling it conversion therapy by trying to convert them away from what they actually are, it's just totally twisted language. And much of this counseling is coming from religious sources as well, which is another reason they want to ban it. Now, Hollywood, it's been normalizing LGBTQ for decades. You know, their characters, they usually had the best lines. They were the most compassionate, lovable, funny. But not coincidentally, for decades, Hollywood portrayed fathers as incompetent doofuses, too. And then the programming began to target our children with gay characters, drag queens, sexy girl series like Cuties. I mean, just a few weeks ago, Calvin Klein published their woke Mother's Day ad, which showed a pregnant, quote-unquote, man, which is actually a woman, but honestly, really looks like a guy. It's so sad. An Apple iPhone, they now have an, emerge, an emoji for him as well. There is an entire month dedicated to Pride, and it's touted as family-friendly inclusive. Again, should young children be exposed to stuff like this? This was a great meme showing what Disney plans to do now with all of their, um, their movies going forward. And then uh, sports teams, of course, are on board as well. This one really bothered me for some reason. On March 29th, the Minnesota Wild held their first Pride Night to raise money for pediatric gender clinics in Minnesota. And I thought to myself, I thought, do these players actually grasp the fact they're raising money for children to be mutilated and sterilized? Do they grasp the fact there's no way a woman will ever compete professionally against a male hockey player? I mean, it's just not going to happen. But all of this, these decades of sexualizing our kids and normalizing everything LGBTQ, this is a stunning chart. Almost 21% of people now born after 1997 identify as somewhere on the LGBTQ spectrum. This shows the transformation by generation. And Ypulse, which is a marketing company, they just published this data in March of 22. They compared Gen Zs and Millennials, which are our youngest populations. Now, those who identify as LGBTQ jump from 14 to 22% since 2017. And Gen Zs now by a large margin, even larger margin compared to the millennials, compare, consider themselves LGBTQ. I mean, is this just an organic and natural evolution of society or is it something else? The change agents are serious. They are coming for our children. I'd like you to listen carefully to the words in this YouTube video that was put up by the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir in the summer of uh, 2021. They really are not hiding their intent. In fact, like I mentioned before, um, the change agents do like to telegraph what they're doing. As we celebrate pride and the progress we've made over these past years, there's still work to be done. So to those of you out there who are still working against equal rights, we have a message for you. 
You think we're sinful You fight against our rights You say we all lead lives you can't respect But you're just frightened You think that we'll corrupt your kids If our agenda goes unchecked Funny, just this once, you're correct We'll convert your children Happens bit by bit, quietly and subtly And you will barely notice it Be disgusted so gross. When they start finding things online That you kept far from their sight Like information Guess what? You'll still be alright Convert your children Someone's gotta teach them not to hate Coming for your children. This song goes on for over four minutes, and they also sing that once they convert your kids, they're coming for you next. Now, they did receive a ton of pushback for this video and claimed it was just tongue in cheek, but I'd like them to prove us wrong, right? So, this relentless campaign of disinformation, gaslighting, indoctrination, censoring, and shouting down the truth about gender, I think we have a name for it. I think it's called grooming because this constant barrage of pornographic images, language, the sexualization of our children, according to the FBI, this is exactly what sexual predators do when they target their victims. And this is a pretty accurate meme. Uh, most of us are pretty content to just live and let live, but that's not good enough for the LGBTQ agents of change. They are trying again, like we have been trying to show you here, to change our children. They're just in our face and their face, and you must conform and affirm. Because, again, this is not about education. It's about revolution. They're hell-bent on transforming the culture. I'd like you to hear from Alex Newman of The New American. He sums the whole thing up really well. Why do you think people are becoming more concerned about sex ed classes? I think the reason people are getting more concerned is because they're finally realizing what's happening. Uh, I think for, for many, many years, American parents were clueless about the kind of really graphic sexual education that was taking place in the classroom. And it goes way beyond just sexual education. We're not just talking about biology or, or health lessons. We're talking about uh, indoctrination that encourages children to adopt certain attitudes and values and beliefs toward sexuality, toward issues of gender. Uh, and these issues are highly controversial, even among you know liberal Democrats. It's just a natural reaction that parents don't want their children exposed to these types of topics. Has the content of sex ed classes changed over time? The content of sex ed has drastically changed over time. And the first people to really pioneer this idea that the government should be sexualizing children, uh, this was uh, back during the Bela Kun regime, the, the communist uh, Bolshevik regime that took root in Hungary for a short time under the leadership of uh, cultural and education commissar Yerji Lukas. And uh, what he wanted to do, and he was very explicit about this, was use this sort of psychological terrorism in the form of graphic sex education to try to break down the uh, moral values of these Hungarian children. And as you look at the history of this, I, I believe that this was the true agenda of the people pushing sex education for the last hundred years. Now, they couldn't come right out and say that. They couldn't start right away in the 1920s, the 1930s, the 19. 1940s, teaching children to go have multiple sexual partners, teaching children that they might have been born in the wrong body and that if they mutilate their genitals, they can be a new gender, or that they should go out and experiment with homosexuality. I mean, this would have been uh, absolutely forbidden. And so with each generation that passes, uh, the content has become more and more graphic. The content has become more and more radical. The values being promoted have been more and more explicitly uh, anti-traditional, anti-Christian, anti-family uh, values. And uh, I think there really is a, a very sinister motive here. And so in your view, what is the motivation behind this change? Well, I think there's several, but I think the, the most basic and fundamental goal is to undermine the nuclear family. And uh, one of the ways that that happens is by undermining traditional morality and traditional values associated with sex. Uh, in the traditional Christian Western view, uh, sex is a, uh, a divine 
issue that is put in the confines of marriage and it's designed to bring children into the world it's designed to bring a husband and wife closer to each other what's happening in these schools is it's being devalued it's becoming something that's just an issue of pleasure something that anybody can do anytime as long as there is consent that's the new moral absolute as long as there's consent anything can happen with anyone it could be multiple partners and ultimately I think the objective is just break down traditional values break down the new nuclear family and uh, and then replace the nuclear family with government. Uh, Marxists have long had this vision of uh, replacing the family and the parents with the state as the primary influence in the child's life in terms of passing on values, in terms of passing on morals, in terms of passing on culture. Uh, families really have, have historically always served as a kind of transmission belt. So Alex, Really, I love it. He summarized in just a few minutes what's taken me, you know, almost 50 here. But I th I think he's just done a really good job of explaining exactly what's going on here. And he also used a term called psychological terrorism. I think that's even more accurate than warfare. That might be the phrase we should be using now going forward. But I do want to add one more thing here, too. All this discussion about gender-neutral language, you know, we tend to sometimes think it sounds just kind of silly and ridiculous and we laugh it off. But it actually has a purpose. In a recent column, Kimberly L. summarized the true intent about gender-neutral language and policies and why we must stand against them, because they are not harmless, and we shouldn't be laughing it off because there is a goal. The goal is that when biology is subdued and transsexuality becomes a legal and cultural norm, it's going to eliminate the blood tie of the mother to the child and it will eventually sever it. And then they call it the triumphal disappearance of motherhood will follow. So today there's legal movements surrounding transgenderism and which are setting the stage for the legal marginalization of mothers, fathers, and families by force of law. So it's getting pretty serious and they have their foot in the gas. So biology, reality, the nuclear family, these things must prevail or we will certainly lose this nation and this war. And I have to address this briefly because not only was a massive psyops about masking and the vaccines unleashed on the world, it wreaked considerable havoc on our children. When it was known that masks were ineffective and pretty much theater, as Dr. Fauci admitted, they still forced our kids to wear them, which conditioned them to follow irrational edicts that defied logic, science, even common sense. Our kids were isolated behind masks and plexiglass or in their rooms. And talk about the guilt they heaped upon our children. For two years, they were told they might kill grandma and grandpa if they hugged them. They've been shamed and blamed and called selfish that they didn't want to wear this mask or be an independent thinker. They were told to tattle on their non-mask friends. They were told that non-maskers and those who wouldn't uh, take the shot were selfish, unwilling to do the right thing. I mean, this whole group think this group herd mentality, uh, that the communal sacrifice you know, that they were making, that others who wouldn't do it uh, were selfish. I mean, seriously, we should be asking, when was the last time a school board or official actually examined all of the available data on the effectiveness of masking or the shots? I mean, has anyone done that? And these COVID safety measures, they have been catastrophic for learn like learning. The data's out and it doesn't lie. But rather than recognize the harm, what did the feds do? They just lowered the learning expectations. And I think the obvious question here is if the injections fail to protect adults, what makes anyone think they're going to protect our kids? Where is the risk benefit analysis? Where is proof that a child's risk from getting COVID and recovering far exceed their risks of an adverse reaction from the shot? We've yet to see any of this from the mainstream media or the CDC. I think these things qualify as never again. We must never again permit this kind of psychological warfare upon our kids. I don't think we have any idea what kind of long-term damage has been done to an entire generation of children. So what's our responsibility? What can we do about any of this? First of all, you gotta shore up your own family. Turn off the TV, spend some time every day in prayer. Your family is precious and essential. We need to love and care for them, listen to our kids or spouse, your parents, relatives, Support them in need. I mean, we really need to shore up our family. Family is our bulwark. And don't be afraid to challenge and unmask the experts. We need to do this personally, politi politically, in meetings, and publicly. Because they've become weaponized against us. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
and do not comply with the new narratives, how to speak and how to act. You need to model respectful non-compliance to your children, your family, your fellow workers in your community. It's time to be bold and be informed on the issues. Take the time to know what's true about all of these things. Remove your children from the public schools wherever possible in fellowship with like-minded believers. Be sure that your children know what's actual reality, what is true about themselves, about gender, about America, history, truth, all of it, because they aren't getting this in public school anymore, so hard decisions might need to be made. And start groups that will learn and educate and equip others to take action. And by all means, take control of your local government. Run for local offices. Speak to your local school board on the record. Audit your school's curriculum. In Minnesota, there's a state law that protects your right to look at every single thing your kids are learning. Support local and national candidates. Get involved in your local Senate district and races. And maybe it's time to even be an election judge for this election coming up this fall. Connect with other like-minded and engaged people. Assist in various campaigns wherever you can. And if you're a lawyer, boy, I sure hope you would consider doing some pro bono work with groups to create lawsuits because as we've seen, schools are not going to self-correct. They're just not going to self-correct. They don't change anything until they receive legal pressure. And be a digital lawyer. Get on all different kinds of social media. Share everything you can with others and with your family. Who cares if you get kicked off with Facebook? There's a whole lot of other avenues to use. And finally, trust but verify. Don't just believe all you hear, even if you think it's coming from someone you think you can trust, because we're living in very dangerous times. You do have to seek out the truth tellers. We can't afford to be silent, because silence is not an option. It's 100% true that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, and we cannot just let others do the heavy lifting for us. Nobody is expecting anyone to do everything, but everyone can do something. Everybody can do at least one thing. Each of us has unique gifts and talents, and it's time to step up to the plate. I hope we can all get behind the mission to protect all children, even if they're not ours. And then resolve who you're going to be. I love this man. I love his sign. I don't know where he came from, but he is speaking my language. But determine if you're going to be courageous, cowardly, or complicit. And then finally, I want to show you this recent clip of Yako Boyens speaking with PragerU about the sexualization of children. Now, Yako has an international ministry um, about uh, to rescue ki people out of sex trafficking. His sister was trafficked for six years, and by the grace of God, she was rescued and healed, and now they're in ministry together. But we met him several years ago when he was speaking in Minnesota. We showed him the CSE curriculum, and he immediately recognized it for what it was, the sexual grooming of children, making them vulnerable targets, easy targets for sex trafficking. And he's been all over this issue since then on many national programs, including Glenn Beck. But this clip really speaks to me, and I hope it speaks to you as well. You know, look at nature. I'm from Africa. You want to know what God intends? I tell you what, come with me. Stuff I've seen. Come walk with me through the, through the bush in Africa. And let's go walk in between a, a, a female lioness and her cubs. Come walk with me. How about, how about we go show the lioness things like this? How about we go show the little cub, hey, you need to be this. You watch what that mother lion does. You die that day. Yeah. It's not a negotiation. She's going to defend and protect. No, even if the male is not there, she's going to make nest and she will fight to death. You know, this is a fact in Africa when six hyenas surround a female lioness, okay? And she's by herself. 80% of the time she dies because they bite at her. Do you know if you introduce one cub, one cub into the vicinity, 100% of the time she lives. You know the difference? When she's alone with hyenas, she's fighting for herself. She dies. When you bring one cup, dear God, I got chills all over. She will fight to death. She will kill all six hyenas to defend that baby. Those are the mothers that I want to see stand up in this country. Perfect. Amen to that, right? So silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. The hour is late, friends. Please link arms with us and with others to save our children and our nation. 
Please visit our website for more information. Like and share our posts on social media. Please consider supporting us because we rely solely on donations from people like you. Sign up for our email updates. And if you'd like to invite us to speak at another event, please get in touch with us. We would love to do it. So thank you very much, and I hope you find this helpful. Have a great day.